So um, just a quick introduction here. Uh, I'm Amy Tapp and I'm uh, the partner who oversees our compliance and revenue cycle services here at Ide Bailey. And I'm joined today by Rochelle Damon, who is a senior manager who also works in our revenue cycle services within our healthcare uh, consulting practice. Um, she'll be doing uh, the bulk of the presentation. I have a few things that I'll talk about more towards the end of the uh, presentation, but we're really happy for you to uh, join us today uh, on our uh, presentation discussing data analytics and incorporating that into your uh, revenue cycle compliance program. Uh, this is the third of a four part series and uh, we do have one more uh, webinar that if you haven't signed up for and it looks like something you might wanna be interested in doing so, uh, we, we still have, you have time to do that. Uh, it's compliance, a year in review, and planning for what's ahead. It's on December 14th uh, from 1 to 2 uh, Central Time. Uh, that will, I'll, I will be a part of that as well as a couple other consultants from our uh, revenue cycle team that work specifically in compliance and uh, follow the OIG work plan as well as uh, Steve Logansgaard will be joining us, who is an attorney uh, that works at Fagri and Drinker in Minneapolis. Just real quick, uh, Rochelle is gonna talk a little bit more about what we're gonna cover today, but just high level, you know, uh, kind of setting the stage, defining some things about data, uh, you kind of have to know some basic things uh, before you can kind of talk about, well, I have, how do I incorporate this into my compliance program? So we're going to go into that a little bit more, as well as um, a strat your data strategy, uh, something to be uh, looked at. And then we'll, we'll cover data analytics and um, how to incorporate that into your compliance program, as well as what needs to be uh, what the expectations are around that. And we'll be spending more conversation on specifically with the revenue cycle. I'm gonna apologize ahead of time. I have been dealing with some cold, fun stuff that I think everybody on the planet is dealing with right now. So I do have a little bit of a cough. I may pause every now and again and take a sip of something to drink. So I'm just gonna forewarn everybody about that. Um, <clears throat> hopefully it's not too distracting. But yeah, today we're going to go into data analytics, one of my favorite topics. I actually, I'm going to kind of jump ahead to the next slide here, um, do a little bit of a reintroduction of myself. I am our um, kind of our proclaimed data nerd on the new cycle team. I actually have a degree in information technology and mathematics and never actually went into the field. I somehow ended up in healthcare. And right now is pretty much the perfect storm. It had a love of computers and technology and programming with mathematics because everything is so mathematically based and all of that. You have to understand how math works to really understand kind of how the programming of everything works and then also how to validate data. Um, <clears throat> and now all of this is tying into our healthcare world and how analytics is becoming such a hot button, you know, word in our industry. I'm sure everybody's heard it. They've heard so much about it. And now, you know, it's, it's needing to become part of our compliance program. And that's something that Amy will cover and we'll get into more detail as we go through all the slides. But you can see here in this, you know, the future of economy is all about data. You can see where I've highlighted where it says data, data analytics, analyzing data, data analytics again. And it's just all, of, um, all about like making sure you can see here in the second sentence, a smoothly running revenue cycle is critical to a healthcare organization's long-term performance. High functioning departments reliably follow processes and procedures, anticipate and mitigate problems. This is where analytics come in, that anticipation of problems, which we'll get into with predictive analytics, mitigating problems, catching errors quickly before they escalate into larger issues. Again, this is where our analytics can catch things. We can track and trend things before they blow up and become such big problems. We'll use analytics to catch those trends before they become really large and fix them, put, process, put solutions in place before they escalate over time. 
So where it says here to consistently accomplish these tasks, healthcare organizations may turn to data analytics software because these tools have the potentially to more rapidly and accurately gauge current performance, pinpoint opportunities and drive improvement. And we all know now we're working with less people. Um, <clears throat> it's on both the provider side and the payer side and the revenue cycle. You know, the payers are just as short staffed as the providers are in these areas. So we have to find more efficient and effective ways of doing things with our time. So analytics is definitely able to help you. So we're going to go through, set the framework of analytics, what it all means, because I know we hear a lot about it, but what does it really mean? How do we implement it? And then what can we do with that in our organization? So we're going to go through the future of data-driven healthcare. You know, what does this look like for us moving forward? What is a data strategy and why do we need one? What is going to make us successful in putting this in place in our organization? What are some of the key elements we need to be effective with our data strategy? And then throughout this, it's not necessarily in order of one, two, three, four, but throughout this, we're going to be talking about data analytics and the compliance program, kind of where these different strategies fit into that and some um, higher value examples that we can utilize for those data-driven solutions as we go through here. <clears throat> so the future of our data-driven healthcare. There's some top trends that we're seeing right now in the healthcare industry, <coughs> excuse me. And you, everyone's probably heard a little bit about these. So we have expanding categories of data. Um, you know, we have so many different ways of getting data now. How do we handle all of this? We have data lakes, um, we have predictive analytics, which I talked a little bit in the last slide and I'll definitely get into more. Um, we have diverse data and then we have this big data. You guys have probably all heard this term too, big data. What does this mean? And AI is art artificial intelligence, which um, you've probably heard of it in terms of bots or when you go onto a website and you see that little person or um, chat box pop up in the corner, hey, how, how can I help you today? Type in your question. That's an example of AI utilizing a bot like that. And then they'll kind of analyze the words you've typed in and provide you with answers if possible. That's a very rudimentary um, example of an artificial intelligence bot. <clears throat> So as far as the expanding categories, this was the first topic. <clears throat> this I think is really important in healthcare and really comes into play with healthcare. Initially there was just three categories, but now we're talking about five, <laughs> excuse me. We have volume, veracity, velocity, variety, and value. You know, traditionally um, big data, like I said, has been categorized into three of the Vs. It was initially volume, velocity, and variety. So right here, volume, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> velocity. So we had a huge amount of data. We had it coming at us at a high speed and we had a lot of different formats of data. So think of video, text, um, our x-rays, digital. Now we have wearables, we have the internet. We have so many different varieties of data, but those categories just didn't accommodate all the additional cap capabilities of the data we had out there. So now they've added value, um, which is we have all this data, but we need to get useful information out of it. So how do we extract the useful data that we can use to make decisions from? And then veracity, incons inconsistencies and uncertainty of the data. So this is something we have to think about, the value and veracity of the data. We have so much data, but what's the trustworthiness within that data? We don't want to make poor decisions <clears throat> because we're not looking at accurate data. Or we're not looking at data in the right way. So I'm going to go through just a really high level definition of each of these. <clears throat> you know, of volume, we have rapid innovation that was driven by COVID-19 with all of our technological advances. You know, we have more data than ever now. So many organizations went to remote visits, remote monitoring and whatnot. So we have even more data coming at us. Like I said, wearables and all kinds of different information. <clears throat> Velocity, you know, healthcare data isn't just coming from our EHRs anymore. We have applications on our cell phones, on our watches. Um, <clears throat> we have patient portals and other methods of data collection just make it more fast and efficient to get all of this information. You know, we're just generating more and more data beyond our traditional methods. But like, how do, how do we catch it all? How do we 
like categorize it all? How do we do something with all of this? And then we have the variety of, you know, healthcare organizations, like I said, we're gathering it from many different sources. We just don't have a lot of like ones and zeros in traditional binary format anymore. Like I said, we have texts, we have PDFs, we have videos, we have voicemails, we have um, web scraping. We have so many different varieties of data. It's just not all in the same format anymore. And then <clears throat> when it comes to value, you know, this means the end result of the data, what it brings to the industry or, or the organization. You know, people are becoming aware that healthcare data is more valuable in the marketplace now than credit cards because the data is so much richer. And that's why you're seeing so much more cybersecurity around healthcare data because it is more valuable than healthcare. You know, a health, uh, or excuse me, not healthcare, credit card. You may get one or two transactions out of a credit card before someone realizes it and it gets shut down. Healthcare data is a whole different beast. There's so much richness to it. And that's why it's becoming much more of a commodity when it comes to um, stealing our data. <clears throat> and then veracity, healthcare organizations, you know, we must focus on the trustworthiness and the quality of the data that we're dealing with, not only to produce the best results and outcomes for our patients, but also really making sure we're keeping that private healthcare information secure, like I just talked about. That's really important. You know, we have all these different varieties of data now. Now it's more important than ever to have a really good plan in place to keep it all protected as well. So as you're developing your data plan, really make sure that security isn't in the background, security is in the forefront with all of this. I'm not going to go into that because that's not my expertise. We have other webinars around that and there's so much information out there, but also make sure that you're keeping security in the forefront of your mind as you're developing all of this. <coughs> Excuse me one second. So we have all this information flowing into our organization now, and we used to store it more in a data warehouse, more of a structured format, which I'll kind of get more into on the next slide. Now you're hearing more and more about these things called data lakes. <clears throat> um, I'm thinking probably at least 50% or people or more people on the call have heard of a data lake when I've had people raise hands in person conferences. That's usually about what I see, 50 to 75%. But there's still a lot of people out there who haven't really heard of a data lake. And <clears throat> so what is it? You can see here a nice little picture of it. I'm visual, I like to show a picture of, of what it kind of is represented by. But a data lake, it's more of a central repository that allows you to store all of your structured, which is more of like what you think of like an Excel spreadsheet and unstructured data, which would be like your voicemails and web, web scraping, those types of things, data at any scale. So you can throw all of this <clears throat> information in one place um, you can store your data as is. You don't have to do any formatting, any structuring ahead of time. And you can run all kinds of different analytics on this data from dashboards, visualizations. You can do big data processing, real-time analytics, and machine learning to just better guide your decision. So it's really nice to have all this information in one place. And why is that important? Because from history, <laughs> when we've wanted to report you know, we've pulled it out of this system to look at this data point. Someone else wants to see the same data point and you might be able to get it out of a different system. And depending on where you're pulling it from, you might get different information because you're pulling from two different data sources. With a data lake, all your information is going into one data source and you're pulling the information from one place. And so everybody is making decisions off the same point of data. That's one of the most important things to think of when you're thinking of this data lake. All the information is coming into one place and you can build all your reports, all your tools, all your visualizations from this one same source. So you can see here, everything flows in, incoming flow represents multiple raw data archives, email, spreadsheets, everything. We have this reservoir where you can run all your analytics, um, the outflow is our actual analyzed data. And then we, um, through the process, we're able to sift through all the data quickly and gain key business insights. This is very simplified, but that's the thought behind a data lake. So why it's needed is organizations, you know, we successfully generate business value from data, hopefully. <laughs> and those that do that will outform their peers. In an Aberdeen survey, they saw organizations who implemented data lakes outperforming similar 
entities by 9% in organic revenue growth. That's just organic growth. These leaders were able to do new types of analytics like machine learning over new sources, um, <clears throat> excuse me, like log files, data from click streams, social media, internet connected devices stored in the data lake. This helped them to identify and act upon opportunities for business growth faster, attracting and retaining customers, boosting productivity, proactively maintaining devices. Think about all of our like IV pumps and different devices we have in the facilities. You know, instead of having to go around and maybe manually check when they need to be maintained, we set up an alert system somehow with our analytics tools, those types of things. And it just helping us make more informed decisions, working on more of an exception basis versus having to do constant monitoring, maintenance and whatnot. We're just working to exceptions which frees up a lot of time for everybody. <clears throat> Some of the challenges though with our data lakes, um, <laughs> there's no architecture, it's just raw data and everything just kind of gets thrown in there with no oversight to the contents. So it can make a data lake pretty unstable and unusable. Um, so it needs to have some defined mechanisms for cataloging and securing data. Without that, you can't find your data. <laughs> so you just have to really make sure that you're understanding how information is getting put in, put in there, cataloged, and so you can reference it. Without that, you know, our trusted data lake will become a data swamp. So, you know, if you put dirty water in, you're going to get some dirty water out. So you just really want to make sure you have some organization and structure around that. Um, meeting a wider audience need requires data lakes to have some, you know, governments, govern, excuse me, governance, sys, um, <clears throat> some consistency and some access controls around that. So, you know, it's not just like, woohoo, we have this big lake, freedom. You still have to have some of those same structures and controls in place to make sure that you're not getting garbage out of it like you would any other database. Just this at a high level. The difference between the data lake versus the data warehouse, data lakes and data warehouses are both used in storing data to this day, um, but they're not interchangeable. You know, like I said, a data lake is a pool of raw data and a data warehouse is much more structured and refined. So you can see the differences here. I'm not going to go through them in, in detail. <clears throat> There's a use case for both. Um, but for those of you that want to know the difference, that is definitely here and you can compare and contrast the two. <clears throat> so the next thing I'm going to get into is the predictive analytics, which you have been hearing more and more about in healthcare. And, you know, it's one of the biggest trends in data for healthcare and really taking data and what we've done in the past and using it to kind of predict what could happen in the future. And so we're starting to see this not only used for patient care, you know, what, what patients may potentially develop heart disease, what patients may potentially develop diabetes, what patients are at potential um, risk for falls and those types of things and putting preventive measures in place before those things happen. But then also for operations now throughout the health systems, you know, using it for financials, using it for compliance. How can we use all this data we have, for example, 835 claim files, the remittance files that you receive at your organization. There's so much data in an 835 claims remittance file where you can start pulling this information out of there and use a, using past adjudicated claims to start developing some predictive analytics on claims payments, um, underpayments, overpayments, and whatnot, which I'll get in here too. <clears throat> So <clears throat> right now we're seeing it, like I said, a lot more used by clinicians, finance departments, human resources, pretty much almost every team within the health care organization. Um, now with the data lakes and all these different data sources, we can pull in socioeconomic and environmental factors in to determine likelihood of cardiovascular disease, like I said, using data and outcomes from past patients to provide insights into methods of treatments that'll work for current patients, improving patient outcomes, thus reducing cost of care, um, cost of healthcare, and predict finances based on past financial performance. So maybe predicting future adjustments, um, predicting future payments, fu predicting future denials, those types of things. Um, also predicting, um, uh, payment outliers, those types of things. 
And so we, <laughs> we can use this data in so many different ways. I also have some examples from organizations, you know, 40% all causes readmissions were reduced by unity point health within 18 months by using predictive analytics, you know, reducing those readmissions by 40% is pretty significant. Um, points of no-show identified by Duke Health System, 4,819 points of no-show. So they were able to start doing more reach out to patients who were more no-shows, like maybe the text reminders weren't working because their phones were shut off. You know, so they needed to um, send letters. Um, maybe they were sending letters and those weren't working, so they needed to make phone calls, you know, those types of things. And then the patients who were no showing during certain times, they started scheduling their appointments at different times where it was easier for them to make it. Those types of things and really looking at that overall to really reduce their no show rates within their health system. And then 35% reduction in adverse events reported by a hospital. This one was anonymous, but you know, a 35% reduction in that is very significant as well, just by using past data to predict what can happen in the future. And again, this is data that you already have within your organization because it's past data predicting future. An example of this in compliance, <clears throat> This is an example that I got from an HFMA article, Compliance Analytics, there's gold in the data. Predictive analytics can help organizations really determine risk areas for underpayment, overpayments, and um, outlier payments, those types of things. You know, data mining can really find those potential revenue opportunities. Like I said, your 835s are a wealth of information. There's so much data in that 835 file uh, <clears throat> from looking at underreported codes, um, unreported codes and other conditions that may lead to over underpayments because underpayments are just as much risk as overpayments are. You know, underpayments are a risk to your organization because that's loss of revenue and overpayments are a risk because, you know, maybe you overreported something, you shouldn't be paying for it. You need to make sure you return that, that money if you shouldn't have it. So, <clears throat> you know, we really need to make sure we're looking at um, especially for the unreported or underreported codes. If we have this, these past claims and we're running analytics on them and we see that you know, <clears throat> 85 out of 100 times we build these two codes together or three codes together, why are we missing it on these 15 claims? Is it because we didn't document it? We didn't do it? Did we just not put the charge in? You know, what's the reason behind that? And we can work by exception to determine, okay, these are build right or no, we truly are missing these charges on these unreported services. And same thing with the underreported, you know, really using that, those past claims to predict the future. And then also there's a, um, a lot of comparative data out there too that you can find where these services are generally reported together and you can compare yourself to those based on your past claims to determine if you have opportunities there as well. So really good information. <clears throat> um, and then you can also um, potentially predict future claims at risk based on past behaviors. So when it comes to denials, you know, are you having any issues there um, with claims being denied for certain reasons that maybe you're not billing things correctly or reporting things correctly? you can look at your trends and track them. And like I said, find the reasons and put solutions, fixes in place to prevent that from happening moving forward. So according to this article, some of the biggest revenue opportunities came from the following areas, you know, DRGs with actual lengths of stays significantly greater than the geomet geometric mean length of stay, claims with organ failure or with infection, infectious disease as the principal diagnosis, Claims with sepsis as secondary diagnosis with actual length of stay greater than the GM LOS. Cases with a missed cardiovascular CC, such as persistent atrial fibrillation, unstable angina, or atrial flutter. This is another thing to really look at. Um, are your DRGs making sure you're not missing any of those MCCs, um, those CCs or MCCs with that, you know, where you can get yourself into a higher DRG, not upcoding but actually getting yourself into that higher DRG um, because maybe we're missing 
documentation. You know, our emphasis should always be on clear, correct, compliant documentation, coding, and DRG assignment. Because from a compliance perspective, you know, like I said, underpayment is just as inappropriate as an overpayment. Um, so in addition to improving our payments, our data analytics can really help us determine how to identify our organization's risk areas, protect these resources, our valuable dollars and cents right now, and improve clinical care for patients. So, you know, this is all really important. And especially at the end of the day, taking care of our patients and giving them the best care they need is imperative. <laughs> so good data mining, you know, we want to make sure we have a team of prospectors because they're in there digging <laughs> that include, you know, we need to make sure we're including our encoders on this. You know, sometimes we do this stuff in a vacuum. We think, oh, this is just technology related. This is just the tech team. No, it's not. We need to have our coders involved in this because they understand what these codes mean. I'm not a coder. When I read this, I, I know the words, but I don't know what it means as far as claim or documentation. Um, compliance auditors to make sure that we're, we're meeting all the rules and regulations that are out there for reporting. Clinical documentation improvement teams, because you know if we have documentation deficiencies, we need to make sure that we're educating our staff. Um, we need to have medical staff involved and revenue cycle representatives, because we need to make sure the right people are involved. The heads of those departments should also participate if, as necessary. So if you're doing a review of um, surgery, you need to make sure that department head is involved. They understand what's going on and they're a champion for it. So if changes need to be made, everyone in that department knows that their leader is on board and is championing those changes as well. <clears throat> so the prospecting team should really begin its work by running, you know, the software built in-house built in-house or purchased off the shelf, whatever you need to do for analytics. You know, there's good options both ways. Identify any claims likely to result in incorrect payment. <clears throat> so not every claim identified is going to contain errors, but you know, we want to again work by exception. So the analytics will will kind of filter those things to the top that should probably be looked at, but it doesn't mean that there's necessarily an error in them. So we need our experts to look at those and conduct a review, a human review of those that float to the top. And then make sure the proper DIRGs, ICD-10 codes have been assigned and go from there. And those ones that have errors, those are the ones we do the research on and put it, put the fixes in place if necessary. <clears throat> so the next little topic we want to get into is our diverse data. <clears throat> And I kind of touched on a lot of this already, but you know, this is really important right now just because of equality of care. Data just is important for inclusive solutions, making sure we're including all the information that's available. And this is what builds up to big data because we have all of this information that's diverse coming from multiple sources and places. And the, the thing now is we're getting all that socioeconomic and social determinants of health in this as well, where we didn't necessarily have that before from those outside resources. And we know that those really, those factors really influence patients' health and can predict the patient's health moving forward. And so <clears throat> that's really important for um, preventative measures for some patients and whatnot moving forward <coughs> and creating better, more holistic treatment plans that have more of an impact for patients. So that's just something to think about in all the different sources we have. You know, we have our payer records, we have smartphones, like I said, public records, EHRs, databases out there, research studies, portals, all of this is just coming at us at one time. <clears throat> and so all of this comes together and creates our, this term big data that you hear out there. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> excuse me, I need another sip of coffee, excuse me, and I'm going to close this polling question. All right, so big data in healthcare, this is the foundation of effective um, artificial intelligence, because if we don't have all this information that I went through already, kind of setting the foundation of all of this, we can't effectively teach artificial intelligence. It's artificial. It has to have something to learn from. You can't just give it one or two pieces and it's all of a sudden going to magically learn. And so, you know, this is something that's really important. You got to feed it good information and it's got to be able to learn from it. And this is something that we're seeing rapidly growing. Like I said, every time you go to a webpage, now you have that little pop-up in the corner. How can I help you today? 
but we just need to throw as much information at it as possible for it to learn. And, you know, of course it has to be specific for what we're trying to teach it, but and the more you can throw at it, the better. One of the significant AI use cases in healthcare is in the use of machine learning and other cognitive disciplines for medical diagnosis purposes. So using patient data and other information, we can help uh, doctors and medical providers deliver more accurate diagnosis and treatment plans, um, can help healthcare be more predictive and proactive by analyzing big data and help with preventive care recommendations for patients, like I said. <clears throat> and my favorite is um, we can use artificial intelligence to look through claims data. <coughs> like I said, that 835 information that we have, we can, we can see what's happened in the past and now we have 837 claims information. We haven't even sent those claims out the door yet. We can use artificial intelligence to look at these past claims to highlight these claims that we're planning on sending out the door and float those ones to the top that are like, hey, something is wrong with these. Either you need a human to look at these or our AI knows that, you know, hey, this needs to be done with these before we can send them out to the door. And a human doesn't have to touch them. You know, we know that, it just needs this flipped or this flipped. We don't need a coder involved. We don't need documentation changed. AI can just do it based on past claims. Or like I said, it can send it to a queue without human intervention for a coder to look at or something. So those are some ways we can use AI in compliance. Like, hey, we've had issues with these claims in the past. You need someone to look at this one before it goes out the door and we have that same issue. So that's a way to think about that. And I do see a comment about AI. Um, as we develop big data for AI purposes, we seem to be moving to a conflict between sharing data, which AI needs to learn with a regulatory privacy framework. In other words, we ask for permissions to share protected health information while AI is looking for data, which the patient customer may. Yeah, and that's one of the things to, you know, we're dealing with uh, protected health information. And the customers may not always want to share this information, which makes it tough. And Amy, I can see Amy's, oh, Amy just closed it. <laughs> and so, you know, that's one of the things that makes it tough too, is we do have to ask for permission from our patients if we're using this data in any way um, outside of just their care. And so, um, you know, making sure that one, we're keeping their information private, it's not getting shared outside the organization. Again, making sure you have really good cybersecurity policies and procedures in place to protect our patient information. And, and if we're not getting that information shared with the AI learning tool, yes, it could definitely possibly have some deficits there. So those are all things you have to think about through these processes. AI is still really new. Um, it definitely still has a lot of holes right now. Um, I think we're probably still a good five years plus before we're really good with AI. And I think a lot of people in my area would agree that there's still a lot of work to be done in the area of AI. Um, but for simple things, you know, some of the examples that we've been talking about here, less patient-based and more compliance-based there's definitely much more capability there <clears throat> as far as using predictive analytics and AI to do some of this compliance work. A good example here, this drug diversion oversight, utilizing artificial intelligence. You know, one of the facts, 10 to 15% of all healthcare workers engage in diversion and illicit drug use. Um, <clears throat> it's really difficult to identify. Um, you, you think about it. I just watched the the Good Nurse, I think it is, um, TV or the movie on Netflix, and then the documentary around it, which is all about this and how they had to pull everything out of Cerner and Pixis, and they had to have a nurse involved to actually teach everybody what all this means and how to actually find those trends in the data. And just think, if you had to have a human doing this to every drug that was ordered and canceled and you'd have to manually reconcile everything, you just, it would be really difficult to catch it. And so UC Davis Health implemented healthcare compliance analytics with the use of AI, and they were able to proactively identify diverters. Um, they, excuse me, were able to protect patients and the workforce and the institution because the AI-based system could really digest all of this volume from all these different sources, like pulling, you know, the, the MAR <clears throat> out of Cerner and pulling 
the drug order reports out of Pixis, for example, and really learning those trends, what those things should look like. And when they didn't look a certain way, the AI would flag it and be like, hey, someone needs to look at this. And so it would really identify and recognize these diversion indicators and techniques because it's all about patterns. You're going to find patterns. If someone's doing something they shouldn't do, there's going to be patterns. And so they were able to move for more, for more of like that audit-based approach, like I was saying, like someone having to go through and manually review records to more of an investigation-based approach. The AI pointed potential patterns out, and then they would go and investigate to determine, yep, this is diversion or no, it's not. <clears throat> so some of the indicators and techniques that they use to kind of train the tool label printing, um, searching patient medication administration records that they shouldn't be searching or searching them more than others, following high dose patients through the system, accessing records outside of shift, um, delayed administration or wastage of drugs. Those types of things help them identify when someone was potentially a diverter of drugs. So this is a really cool example of AI, <clears throat> especially timely, like I said, the documentary that's out there on Netflix. Really cool. Watch it if you get a chance. So what is a data strategy and why do you need one? Um, I'm going to go through a few techie slides here, but this is really important, again, to get that baseline in place. You really, you can't just like throw this in place and hope it works and sticks, but you really have to have a plan in place um, to get it there. And <laughs> excuse me, it's really important because you're going to get more efficient at what you're doing. You know, around compliance, compliance is when I was heavily involved in compliance, I felt like I just sat with mounds of paperwork and was like flipping through records and flipping through charts and flipping through spreadsheets and everything. And that's not very efficient. That's not a very effective way to do that. So, you know, using data can get you more efficient there. Um, we can grow. Um, this is more towards market opportunities and service lines, but if we can identify some of our risk areas and, and grow our bottom line revenue wise, because we're finding compliance areas where maybe we're under reporting for revenue and whatnot, we have more revenue there than to grow our services, maybe hire staff if we can find um, staff to support us or reinvest in our technologies, those types of things. Um, really under uncovering value trapped in our processes and systems. You know, it's amazing once you start digging through the data, you'd be surprised at what you start finding that you didn't know was there, whether, you know, it's missed revenue or undercoding, overcoding, um, you know, missing documentation, all of those areas of opportunity that are really difficult to find when you're just looking at things one by one helps us make better decisions and make them faster. <laughs> and we're really turning all these mountains of data or this big lake of data from a liability, you know, everybody pulling information from disparate data sources, looking at data in different ways, interpreting it in different ways. You know, that's, that's a liability. I came from an organization where I think we spent more time arguing over whose data was right than actually looking at the data. So it's turning it from that liability into an asset. We're all looking at the same data source. We're looking at the same numbers and we're making decisions from the same place. Water. And why do we want a data strategy? Well, payment model disruptions, you know, we're, we're seeing payments move from volume-based to value-based. And I think we're just going to keep seeing this over time. So how can we treat patients more effectively um, <clears throat> the most and the most cost-effectively while getting the best results. Um, consumerism, price transparency. <laughs> um, patients are shopping around. They're looking for the best bang for their buck. We don't have, we have a lot of non-traditional competitors in the market now um, providing healthcare services. And so we just, we have to make sure we're still competitive in our markets as well. We have industry challenges. Healthcare is really fragmented um, with very distributed data infrastructures, which is another part of you know getting all this data into one spot. We have um, I work with health systems that have two, three, four different EMRs 
and a different billing system on top of it and trying to pull all this information together to get like good data out of it can be very difficult sometimes. So finding a way to get all this in one place and report off of it <coughs> just makes sense. And then the artificial intelligence revolution like we got into, you know, we like I said, we keep hearing more and more about it. And I think it's just going to become more and more part of our daily lives. So we might as well start talking about it now and figuring out how to get ourselves there. <clears throat> so with data infrastructure, you know, leading data-driven organizations versus everybody else, they have that centralized data asset instead of those data warehouses. You know, like I said, we're pulling data all from the same place. All stakeholders are working off that single version of the truth. Our data, we're data-driven and motivated teams. You know, we're really letting that data tell us the truth and tell us where we need to go. There's so many times I hear, well, I think, I feel, I see, but that doesn't really tell us what's really going on. It's more like I need to hear, I've had 500 claims denied from United Healthcare within the last month for CPT code 99214. What are we gonna do about it? You know, Here's how we need to dig into it. We're really taking action off of facts. And then you know, we have automation in place. Like I said, we're all working more with less people. We have to find ways to let technology do those things that we don't need people necessarily doing, which also helps eliminating errors in the process. You know, It helps with keying errors and data entry errors and other things that may happen that a human may make. And if a human doesn't have to do it, let's let our computer systems do it, robotic process automation, some kind of technology, let them do it so we can let the humans do the things that we really need that brain power for. So everybody else out there, application-based reporting, like I said, they're arguing over whose data is right. It's very um, siloed, um, working on different islands of data instead of a core system you know, manually generated reports and, and distribution, like emailing reports or pulling a lot of one-off reports. It's very time consuming. It's not real time. It's very limited. And that's probably what a lot of health systems are working off now. And that's just the honest truth. And that's just because health system, healthcare and banking <laughs> tend to be behind the times when it comes to technology, but it's not the nice thing about the technology now it's not cost prohibitive like it used to be. So you can do a lot of this for not, not the cost that it used to be just even five years ago. <laughs> so we really want to move up this data maturity scale. <clears throat> you know, we, we probably live a lot here still. Oops, I'm on the wrong screen. <laughs> I live a lot in this. Um, I'm going to go back to this one and use my pointer. We live a lot in this right here, right now, this descriptive and diagnostic. We have the information, we're doing a lot of it based off of our, our history. So running Excel spreadsheets, looking at it and, oh, this is what happened before. So this is what we're gonna continue to do, da, 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 da. We're getting a little bit more into the diagnostic, like why did this happen? We want to move more into the predictive, what is going to happen? And then like, what is going to happen, but how can we influence something to happen? Like, how can we make it happen? And of course, the higher you get up here, you get the higher value out of it, but it's also more difficult to do and usually a little bit more costly. But this is where all of this presentation is about this predictive and prescriptive, you know, what will happen and once we know the different things that can happen, how do we influence the one that we want to happen? That's where we want to be in all of this. And with healthcare, you know, it can be a little bit more challenging because we don't know what is going to happen in the world. You know, COVID, we didn't know that was going to happen. So we were not able to predict what happened to our revenues over the, you know, in that, in that time frame. We weren't able to predict that big dip or anything because that had never happened before. But now we have data. We know what could happen in a situation like this again. We have the descriptive and diagnostic information to be able to do predictive and prescriptive analytics if we ever get into this situation again. We're much more prepared. All right, I'm gonna turn the laser pointer off. So some key elements of developing an effective data strategy. 
we really want to make sure we have relevance, we have assets, we have tools, and most importantly, we have discipline around this. Because I've seen what goes wrong when you do not have good discipline around this. So relevance, you know, we really want to make sure we have a data strategy that's connected to your organization's strategic goals and missions, specifically for this presentation, your revenue cycles, goals, and missions relating to your compliance. So making sure we're meeting with that, like I said, the compliance officer, the revenue cycle, and pulling in coding and whoever else we need when we're thinking about these different strategies. We want to make sure <clears throat> we're defining, um, defining our measures in like winning measures, we really want to put things in place that we can quantify and understand like, okay, this is a win. Okay, let's move forward. This is a win, let's move forward. So identify some market opportunities. Um, again, you know, this is a little bit around marketing growth and market share, but what do we have for opportunities as far as our compliance risk? So again, meeting with the compliance officer, looking at the OIG work plan, what do our current, what are our strategies for the next year um, based on what the OIG is looking at and what our internal compliance team is, is um, really focusing on and how can we build our data strategy and data plan around that? What can we develop to help in these areas for these teams to focus on this information and work to exception versus it being a very manual process? <laughs> And then we want to um, target specific measures of performance to monitor. So, you know, we want to be able to show that we're improving or show that we are measuring and we're actually using this to monitor and improve function. So let's say the goal is um, maybe um, poor documentation in the operating room. I'm just throwing something out there. So right now we have maybe a 65% compliance rate for our documentation overall with our providers or something. So we have a goal or then we want to set a goal. We want to get all providers to X compliance within blah, blah, blah. So we have our baseline, we have our current goal and we have something to measure too. So, you know, just keep those things in place. You always want to have a goal. You want to have something that's definable and measurable because then you can actually measure your improvement over time. Um, assets. <clears throat> so data is unlocked and mobilized from your systems. We have our accounting systems. We have our EHRs. We have sometimes our billing systems. We have our clearing houses. You know, any other systems that you have, you want to make sure that you can pull it out and have it in a format that's accessible and actionable. <laughs> um, as a RevCycle consultant, and I know Amy can speak to this too, getting data is one of our biggest challenges. Um, every system is a little different and it depends on the setup within the systems and just the knowledge at the different health systems. Just getting the data out can be one of the biggest challenges ever. And then understanding that the data you have is good data. That's also very difficult. So you wanna make sure that you can pull it all out and then you want to consolidate it. You want to make sure that um, it's all in one place. And if you're pulling, let's say for accounting, um, you have an, uh, um, actually, I'm going to use uh, days in AR. This is always one of the biggest ones we get. Um, one of the biggest challenges of which day, which one is right, who's calculating it right. You know, <clears throat> everyone pulls it and then like, let's sit down and talk about, okay, which one is the right one? Which is the one we're going to use? What one is going to go into our central data repository? Okay. And that's the one we're sticking with. That's the only one we're using. So there's a little bit of that through this process too, a little bit of data governance and agreeability on, okay, this is the one that's running and this is the one that's going in here. Um, we want to make sure we're enriching our data. So pull in, you know, your CMS data, your fee schedules from CMS, your fee schedules from your payers, if possible, any other kind of data that you can pull in to glean some additional insights and create that single version of the truth, like I said. Um, create correlations between those desperate data sets. So basically linking your data sets together. Think of it like an old access database where you have those keys, you know, making sure that you can correlate all the data together in one way, shape or form. And then develop a, um, a model that supports the development of all these different metrics that you're trying to measure. <clears throat> so I'm getting a little techy here, but um, <laughs> you're technology team, or um, if you're with a, a bigger organization, you know, they could kind of help you this, or if you go with a third-party vendor, they can definitely get you through some of this technology stuff. 
Um, tools, you want to make sure that you have a standardized tool that can help you manage and present the data. There's so many different tools out there. It just all depends on one, your size, your need, and how much you want to spend. <laughs> so you don't have to spend a ton of money. You don't need super fancy tools. Um, you just need the ones that, to do the job. So you, you may have to build some data pipelines um, and do some integrations. But for the most part, <clears throat> you can do manual pulls or build out a, a, a robotic process automation that can pull data for you at, at a certain time every day or weekly, whatever. Um, you have to select a data visualization tool, something like Power BI, Tableau, Domo, something like that out there to actually like build your dashboards and visualize everything. And then you have to have monitoring and management capabilities. You know, someone has to oversee all this to make sure that everything is continually working and presenting the data accurately. We have to think about data warehousing. Do we want to use a traditional data um, database, data warehouse, or do we want to go data lake? Just depending on the volume of a volume and type of data that you're going to be storing. And then, do we want to go down the road of machine learning, artificial intelligence? If we do, that will drive some of those decisions above that um, for data storage and whatnot. <clears throat> and then discipline, this is a big piece of it. You know, we have to have responsibilities throughout this process and really make sure that we have accountability as well. So we really need to understand our KPIs. And again, if we're dealing with web cycle and compliance, that team, it'll probably change year over year with the OIG. Um, what they're focusing on and what the internal compliance team is focusing on. So those KPIs will probably change over time. Um, making sure we're having regular monitoring and reporting of results. I don't necessarily think you need daily standups in this, but I think it's really important as you develop those KPIs. Where, where do you want um, those variance points to be? You know, what is an alert point? Like if we're too far over or under, we can have the system alert somebody like, hey, we're not where we need to be. We need to look at this. That's the value of data analytics. You don't have to continually keep your thumb on it, but you need to be alerted when something goes wrong. Um, and then <clears throat> this really provides a platform for data-driven innovation. Um, when you have everything in one place, it's really kind of easier to change your KPIs are what you're going to monitor. Um, so if the OIG comes out with something quickly, you can go in that data and kind of quickly change your tune <laughs> because it's all there. Um, and then it also provides facts. So we're doing rational decision making in times of crisis. As we all know, over the last few years, we've had probably a lot of emotional decision making um, as well as factual, but uh, data really helps that, you know, instead of I feel, I think it is, this is what the data is telling us, and therefore this is what we should be doing. So I'm going to pass this over to Amy. We have data analytics and your compliance program, and we have a few slides from the DOJ that she's going to cover. And can you just advance the slides when I tell you, Rochelle? Yep. yep. Okay. No problem. So I think Rochelle's given some really great examples and uh, set the stage as far as, you know, describing how to get at things. Uh, but here's why this is important. Uh, the Department of Justice Criminal Division back in June of 2020 uh, put together guidelines that they expect that you uh, as an organization continually update and incorporate data as part of your compliance program and your risk assessment, that it's not just a one and done or a snapshot in time. Uh, and then this is just telling uh, some of the rationale and the comments that were in that uh, to the investigators, you know, that they expect that they would look favorably upon a uh, organization that does actually look at data um, throughout their process, measuring things, just like some of the things that uh, Rochelle spoke to, uh, and that you periodically update your risk assessment based on what you're seeing through some of these data analytic functions. Uh, just go on to the next slide. Um, more on this uh, that came out of that, uh, just some of the things that you can look at that they're considering 
um, you know, has this periodic review then resulted in any sort of updates and policies or procedures or um, internal controls? And do they account for risks discovered through misconduct or other problems with the compliance program? And that do the compliance personnel and the internal audit and control personnel have the sufficient direct or indirect access to relevant sources of data um, that allows for timely and effective monitoring. And if they don't, what is prohibiting them or impeding them from doing that? And what's the company doing to address some of those things? So just, you know, the federal government is using AI and data analytics uh, as part of their investigations more and more. So if you are ever presented with some sort of investigation, or a letter notifying you of an audit, they already have a lot of information by looking at your claims data, probably more so than you would give them credit in the past. Um, so the more you can be prepared for something like that, um, you know, the better you're off you are as an organization. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over now to uh, Rochelle to wrap it up and, um, like I said, she's already given you some really good examples of things that you could be incorporating into it. I point to that HFMA article she mentioned, um, and then things with drug diversion or its financial anomalies within the revenue cycle and the A35 data. That is mm -hmm. huge, a wealth of information. Yeah, and speaking of that, um, here's an example of taking 835 claims data um, and just looking at some information, some trends with different payers as to um, the type of denials that are out there with the payers and distributions between codes. Like I was saying, you know, looking at a certain payer and seeing how many um, different codes were denied, the different mark and cart codes, um, the different payers you may be having some issues with, and really drilling down to determine the root cause, again, which could be documentation issues. We may be having some coding issues and all of that. So <clears throat> tailoring these dashboards to be in line with your compliance program um, is really important. And as you can see here, this is a one-stop shop. You know, this is a denials example, but you could have a coding. This could be coding. This could be documentation. It could be, you know, anything to track and trend and easy to just click and see, you know, what's going on at any point in time in these areas. And you can create alerts to be like, you know, right here, something, someone maybe gets sent an email saying, whoa, this is high, you need to check into this, you know, it could be a specific provider, it could be a specific code, however you want to tailor that information. Um, and again, this is all just gleaned right from the 80, 835. And then another one is pricing. You know, pricing is another compliance risk area. Now we're hearing so much about pricing, the price transparency, and now the No Surprises Act, really making sure you understand where you are with your pricing. And that's another place you can use analytics, surprisingly, you know, taking your information, your contract information, your market information, and kind of looking at all of that and be like, okay, do I have a defensible pricing strategy? If I looked at my charge master right now and I pointed to this line item, could I explain to somebody how I came up with this charge? So that's another opportunity to look at data and let it tell you a story and let it tell you where you have some opportunities for improvement. So those are just two more examples to think about where you don't need anything fancy, you don't need anything crazy or complicated, but you can build something and let data tell you a story. So some final thoughts, I know I'm over by a minute right now, but you know, they really have analytics really have the potential to drive in some improved value, pinpointing areas where you can be proactive. That's the biggest thing, being proactive. Getting on the issue before Medicare sends you a letter, OIG sends you a letter, DOJ sends you a letter, find it yourself first. And so analytics can definitely help you with that. Um, trending towards analytics to help improve the value of healthcare, you know, driven by advancements of technology, the cost is definitely coming down, healthcare reform, regulatory mandates, like Amy just kind of went over with the DOJ, they're highlighting like, hey, you should really have analytics as part of your compliance program, we're looking for it. Um, and then just really creating that data-driven culture, 
and um, in which the use of analytics becomes the norm. You know, it, it really needs to be a commitment from leadership and just making decisions based off of facts. <laughs> Excuse me. So any questions? There aren't any in the chat or the Q&A at this time, but I would say if, you know, since we're over, if anybody has anything uh, that they wanna reach out to us, feel free to do so. And again, just a reminder that we have the compliance, a year in review and planning for what's ahead coming up on December 14th. And we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to sit in and listen to our uh, webinar today. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Hope everyone has a great day. Mm -hmm.